Today we're going to the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library and Museum here in Austin, Texas, Ooh. home of the Texas Longhorns. <laughs> everybody he could get where he wanted to go. He understood from the start that this was a city that was a magnet for uh, ambitious people. He had an incredible sense of the jugular of every member of Congress. He could remember where every senator stood on different issues. What were their vulnerabilities? What were their strengths? What did they need in their district? He had telephones everywhere he could possibly be, which meant that there was never a free hour when he wasn't calling some congressman, some businessman, some labor leader. I was impressed that he was the first senator to actually step forward and volunteer for the armed forces after Pearl Harbor got bombed. I liked that the library had a, a very good timeline of what was going on with society in general, also what was happening in the United States and around the world, and then they timed that with um, what was happening with LBJ at that point in time. I thought it was uh, really interesting and, and funny that um, where they have the animatronic of um, Lyndon Johnson and he is telling jokes. So it's about his humor. Um, aside that, I never really explored before, never really thought of, uh, but he seemed to, it, it showed his, um, why people were drawn to him and his likability. You want to go through the hearing? He said yes. Well, he said, why didn't you do it? Well, he said, the doctor said, I got it home and I considered it. And I just decided that I like what I drank so much better than what I heard. <laughs> They talked about the Johnson treatment, his ability to take somebody and really just either intimidate him or make him feel at home, depending on how he pleased. I liked some of the um, some of the phone calls that were made. You could pick up the phone or the the little receiver, or you could listen to phone calls that he had made with leaders, with um, journalists, with, in his personal life. So it was interesting. Um, some of the most interesting to me were the ones with Robert Kennedy and talking about getting people out to vote. Um, also, um, he would contact. Um, uh, Martin Luther King and they would have good conversations about how civil rights is moving along and what needs to happen and if anything bad happens how they're going to address it you know was was really very involved with with keeping everybody informed along the way at one point um, there was one with his wife Lady Bird Johnson and she was critiquing his uh, one of his speeches and um, it was interesting how she, she dealt with his personality. Um, but he was very open to listening to, to her ideas and um, I think that made him a, a better president. LBJ was the first one to really start using recording and the phone in office from what I understand. There was phones everywhere, it was amazing that in every exhibit, he had a phone somewhere. Even some of the pictures they showed throughout the exhibit would have him in bed, surrounded by five of his, you know, advisors having conversations of things he needed to accomplish. So there was no end to this guy's work day. He just really put it in. Like one of the phone calls you talked about, he had a phone call after Kennedy was assassinated. He called Gerald Ford, who was, a, I guess, a house or senator at the time. And he just gets on the phone and you listen to the recording and you go, he goes, hey, Jerry, 
Um, I'm going to need you on this one. You know, forget about whatever party you think you belong to. I'm going to need you to step up and just get on this. I've already made a commission. It's the Warren Commission. They're going to be investigating this. I need you to get in there, drop whatever you're doing, and get on this thing. We need to solve this. American people need to know their government's secure. And it was like, oh, you know, there was not, hey, I need a favor or anything. It was, boom, you work for me, and this is what you're going to do. And there wasn't, I'm sure there was political infighting back then, but it didn't seem to matter with him. I don't think he was truly a Democrat or a Republican, but just a guy that wanted to get things done. Yeah, he was definitely a, a man with a plan, um, and that came across clear throughout every exhibit, every phone call. He had, we're going to do X, Y, Z, one, two, three. This is what I need from you. Uh, this is why I want it from you. And this is why I chose you. And this is, you know, move forward. It was, um, it was like he was asking them to participate, but it ended up being really, he's telling them that they're going to do this and why they're going to do this. They had a very good um, astronaut exhibit and space exhibit there. Um, it wasn't all encompassing by any means because it was just a small part of his presidency, but there were uh, little sections of uh, the Gemini and then going to Apollo uh, projects and how they, um, you know, he was very instrumental with helping move that forward and actually landing on the moon um, you know, about six months after he ended his presidency. They also had a Vietnam section in the, um, in the library, and it was, it, it was interesting how it was put together um, because it, it had you kind of making the decisions, and with the data that he had available to him, and the resources that he had available to him at the time. And so, um, you know, uh, hindsight, it's always easy to, to armchair quarterback type thing, um, you know, fifth quarter, go back in and say, well, this is where all the mistakes were made. But while it is occurring, it's, it's a different story. Visiting the Oval Office, um, it was or it was one eighth smaller than the actual overall Oval Office, but it was very um, it was it was really neat to see. I liked all of the books he had. Um, the books were the writings of all of the other presidents, so it was clear that he was looking back at history and and um, learning from them um, on how to proceed forward. the one part of the exhibit that showed gifts that had been given to him. Of course, we always knew the presidents weren't allowed to keep the gifts, you know, because they are a gift to the United States or considered a gift to the United States. What I didn't realize is that each president at the end of their term has the right to either say, I want to keep that gift and pay the fair market value of it, or it can automatically be donated to the presidential library. So it never really is their possession, but they get to keep it along with their library. Uh, one of the swords that was given to him from Saudi Arabia, I believe it was, golden sheath encrusted with diamonds and jades. And I'm thinking, well, gaudy first off, but secondly, it was just amazing because that thing had to have been a million dollar sword. And one of the most impressive things I got out of this museum was how he was raised. When he became president later, a lot of people felt, ooh, this is not good, you know, all the civil rights stuff that Kennedy's been trying to do, and here all of a sudden we've got a Southerner coming in, it's gonna get reversed. But you come to find out that his father actually stood up against the Ku Klux Klan and bigotry in the South. LBJ's first job, be a teacher for a group of Mexican students in Texas. You see these kids come to school, you know, with not enough clothing or food, hungry, uneducated, and he realized that there was discrepancies in human life and he, he learned to value all life at that point. It wasn't a color or a race, it was all life. 
I think that humble beginning, you know, from a farm community and that background really led to a great leader. He was inspired by FDR. He believed in the New Deal um, and he wanted to complete the New Deal for, for FDR. Um, and so he spent a lot of his time working on um, items such as Head Start and PBS and the arts and war on poverty. Um, they did food stamps and Medicare, Medicaid. Um, boy, he had a, a lot of other social programs that would have fallen more in line uh, with, with the New Deal. He was eligible to get re-elected for another term, but he turned it down. He was very clear, I'm not going to seek or accept the nomination for presidency from my party. In the series, they talked about how he knew he was in a quagmire at Vietnam. There was no way that throwing troops at it was going to solve the issue, and there was no way pulling out and just turning it over to communism was going to work either. But at that point, he knew that he was no longer the right candidate to hold it, and he was willing to step aside and hope for something better with the next. I think well, part of that decision also was that he he knew that he had asked a lot out of Congress, and um, they had asked a lot of him, and he felt at that point in time that there was, there was no more that um, he could ask or they could ask of him. And so he knew that it would be more of a, a lame, buck, lame duck type of presidency and he knew that wasn't going to uh, be good for the United States.